Today we're going to turn a once turned green bull and it's pretty big. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bull. Today we're going to do a once turned green wood bull. Now, this is green wood, but it was cut maybe five or six weeks ago, so it's not dripping wet. The interior of it is still going to be very wet. The extremities, the ingrain on the sides of it have dried substantially. You may have noticed too that there's mold on the side of that. Well, Whenever there's moisture and there's an organic surface such as wood, you're going to have mold. There are millions of different types of mold. They're not all dangerous and a little bit of mold in your ingrain is not going to be a problem. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be turning a nice even wall thickness. And when, we've, when we're done turning that, that's going to dry pretty quickly. When we have dry wood, we won't have mold. The other thing too is because we're once turning this, it will move and distort a little bit. But because we're going to have this nice irregular top edge, uh, the live edge bowl, it's not going to be as noticeable compared to making a nice smooth circle top bowl where you're going to see those sides come in and it's going to change more to an oval shape. With the irregular shape and with the bark edge on that, it's not going to be as noticeable. So I'm not too worried about a little bit of movement. I'm going to make the foot a little bit bigger so that I can sand it later because it will change and curve as this piece dries. So we've got a lot of things to do here, but the first thing we have to do is attach a large face plate to the center of this. And to do that, I have to clear off some bark on the top. So that's what we're gonna do right now. So let's get to it. There are several different ways we can clear off this bark. I'm gonna be using a pretty large face plate. This is a big bowl blank. It's about 80 pounds and 19 inches in diameter. Now I can already hear the people that are getting ready to leave comments. This grinder with this four inch chainsaw bit or disc on it can be very dangerous, yes. However, when it's used properly, it's a great tool for removing this bark. First of all, you're gonna to wanna to make sure your grinder has that side handle and you have two hands on, the, on this tool at all times. If you engage the top edge of that wheel, it can kick back very easily. But instead, you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of nibbling with the side of it, kind of similar to the way I sand bowls. You're just using an edge that is turning away from you and doesn't catch, and you just slowly work your way around, leveling off that surface. Again, keeping both hands on the tool at all time, and when the tool comes to a stop is the only time when you want to put it down as well. Okay, so I'm checking the surface, and now that I've got some material removed, I also really want to mark that center and make sure that I'm close to it. Now what I'm looking at here is the angle of the top edge of the bowl. I don't really care about that flat bottom portion of the bowl blank because what's important is the top rim of this bowl. So there's a little bit of material that needs to be removed still. So I'm going to level that out and then I'm going to reset the faceplate and then check it again. What I, what I don't want is I don't want one side of the bowl to be really high compared to the other side. That would be it's just a little awkward when it's sitting on a tabletop. Okay, so now I'm going to mark the center and I'm just essentially going across it. I usually go across once and then I go perpendicular to that And then I'll, I'll go and mark at about a 45 degree angle to those two marks just to check it. And I'm kind of eyeballing the center here. It's not perfect, but it's going to be very close. And this is almost 19 inches across. Okay, so now that we have the center mark there, I can put the faceplate back up and look straight down to the hole and I can see that uh, I still have some material to remove. So if you're not comfortable using a power tool like that, or you don't want to purchase a power tool like that, you can, you can remove the bark with a chisel and a mallet, just as I'm doing here. I have this one area on the side of the face plate location that needs to be cleared out a little bit. There are multiple ways to remove that bark material. The cool thing about this wood, this is pecan, by the way, and it has almost like two bark layers. There's an outer kind of loose shaggy bark almost, 
and then there's an, an underlying bark. So most of this exterior bark is going to fall away because it is loosely attached. Now the way I attach the screws with this is I put one screw in partially and then I go across to another location and I line up that hole again and then put the second one in. If you tighten that first one, it usually torques the faceplate off of center. And now I just go through and put them all in. Now with the weight of this bowl blank and the size of it, I am actually going to use all of these holes and fill them up. I sped up the video obviously because this is kind of boring. All right, now I get to show you guys a feature of my lathe that's pretty unique. This is the Robust Sweet 16 lathe and this has a lathe bed gap or some people have told me that this is called a gap lathe now i also have this control panel down here now this is the first version of the sweet 16 there's the second version has this control panel in a little bit more convenient location what i'm doing here is i'm resetting the brake setting or the the way that the electric motor for this lathe slows down the Default setting is 2.5, but with a heavier piece like this, I've discovered that that doesn't work. What will happen is the lathe will attempt to stop within a short period of time, and it can't because of the size and weight of this bull blanket. It's basically like a flywheel. So what will happen is the electronics sense that the lathe hasn't stopped, and it just disengages, and it will freely spin for a very long time because again it's a flywheel <laughs> so if I change that setting up and in this case I think I had it on 18 or 19 and that's usually a good setting for a heavier piece like this and it will break it it takes longer to slow it down and break it uh, or or stop its rotation but this is the best way to do that the Sweet 16 comes with a tailstock extension, which is a simple M2 to M2 extension, which allows that live center to be extended out a bit farther. And it's pretty convenient. If, you, if you're interested in getting one for your lathe, I'll put a link in the description below for that tailstock extension. Also, I have all the tools that I use in my videos. I put the description, I put the details for those in the description, so you want to check those out. The tailstock is going to give this a little more stability so that it's not vibrating quite as much. And with all pieces you turn, you want to start out at the slowest rotation speed initially and then slowly bring that speed up. And I'm going to be turning this very slow for a time being because of the irregular shape. But as that shape becomes a little more balanced, I can speed up the lathe. So what I'm using here is my 5 8 inch bowl gouge. This is a 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. And I'm using this to rough out the material. This is probably the choice tool that I use for roughing. There you can see as the piece goes around how the base is not flat anymore. And that's because we made the decision to locate the face plate at an angle so that we can make the rim appear relatively balanced. So we're sacrificing the flatness of the bottom here to make the top rim, which is more important. These are simple push cuts. I've got the bull gouge angled at about 10 o'clock position. If the flute was pointing straight up at 12 o'clock, this is pointing at about the 10, 10.30 position. And you want to just take your time here and slowly round that corner off. But as we're rounding that corner off, we're doing two things. We're flattening the base of the bull blank and we're taking off some of that side material that's unbalanced. The more we do this, the more balanced the, the blank will become and the faster we can turn it. One of the things you can do so you don't get beaten up while you're doing this is not push the bull gouge into the blank. All the pressure that you're applying should, with the left hand should be down into the tool rest. That'll also make a nice clean pass. Here you can see how the cut is thick in one area and thin in the other. Now I'm going to go ahead and, and make a push cut from left to right. And I'm going over, I just want to level off that high spot. Now I'm moving from left to right with that pushing cut. So my bull gouge flute is angled at about the 130 position. 
if again if the flute were pointing straight up and that's 12 o'clock then it's angled over at about the 130 position and push down on the tool rest and what we're basically doing is you're presenting the tool so when the area of the material comes around that is in line with that cutting edge comes along it essentially just gets sliced across the cutting edge of the bull gouge versus having it push the bull gouge back out. If you push the bull gouge into the bull blank, then you're essentially just riding all of those up and down patterns and you're going to get all kinds of vibration and that vibration is going to go up into your shoulders and you're going to wear yourself out and you're going to get really, really tired. So instead, put pressure down into the tool rest and locate that bull gouge right in the path of the material that needs to be cut. This can be a little tricky moving that around because it's got to, I got to make sure I don't go off the edge of the bed lays there. All right, so I'm going to sh sharpen this bull gouge. I've only turned for a little bit, but the bull gouge is clearly performing subpar at the moment. And you have to remember that the size of the bull blank, the larger that gets, the more feet and actually miles <laughs> or kilometers, if you want to think of it that way, that you will be turning, or this bull gouge will be cutting. So if you take the circumference of that bull times the rotations per minute, so if it's rotating, say, right now it's not very fast, I would guess it's probably about four or 500 RPM. If you're rotating at four or 500 RPM multiplied by several feet, within a couple minutes, that bull gouge has cut many, many miles or kilometers depending on how you look at it. So it's going to dull really relatively quick. With this bowl, I'm going to be turning or I'm going to be sharpening about every 10 minutes. I'm going to show you some of those sharpenings, but not all of them. And just keep that in mind that you really want to keep that tool sharp. Starting to get to a level surface here, which is nice. You can see how the material is coming by and grabbing the tool. And then when I finally reach a point where it's a continuous cut, it's a very smooth pass. Right there, we're into a smooth area, and it's just, it's just a very nice, gentle push cut right across the surface. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to pull the tailstock back because I need to remove that center material. I'm going to pull the tailstock off and out of the way. And then I'm going to remove that center area. Because I'm going to be forming a tenon and a shoulder, I don't want to add this waste material out there. And my tenon is going to be larger than what you're seeing right here. With the faceplate, this is a relatively secure procedure. And it's It's nice to have the tailstock up there, but it doesn't have to be there at all times. So I'm just going to use this push cut and clean off this area, just as I did the, the surrounding portion. With the lathe rotating as slow as it is, again, probably only three or 400 RPM, that center is moving very slow. So you have to slow that pace of the cut down to correspond to the lathe speed. Otherwise, you'll just be skipping across and you'll be creating tool marks and tearing out grain. Okay, so I'm using my dividers here and I'm only touching with the left portion of the divider and I'm seeing that the right point is over the line. That divider measurement is the width of my largest four jaw chuck. So that's going to be the indication of where the cylinder will be. You can see actually see the force, the leverage you have out there at the 18 inch mark. If you take too deep of a cut and push too hard into the wood, you can actually stop the lathe. I was actually getting a little belt squeaking there. The belt was slipping just a bit. 
So I'm going to make a little bit thinner, lighter cuts and move across this, the area that I'm going to remove for the tenon. Everything so far has been done with the 5 8 inch bull gouge with the 55 degree bevel swept back angle. And it's time to sharpen again. And several times during this bull turning, I was, I was sensing that the edge was getting dull and returned to the sharpening station to sharpen and the CBN wheels were still spinning because they are like flywheels as well and they'll spin for a long time after the grinder is turned off. You can see on that left wing when it comes around here that it was showing that the dull surface right there at the top. There's just a touch. I need to go and remove all of that so that bevel's nice and clean right up to the top, top cutting edge. So the tenons formed. What I need to do now is establish the shoulder. Now why I'm taking the time to do this is because I want to establish the base of the bowl. If you think of the curve shape or the shape of any bowl, the two defining factors are the rim and the base. That's kind of your, your A to B location. The curve and the line or the shape of that curve connecting point A to point B is what determines how the bowl will look. So the sooner you can establish the those two points, the better and the quicker you're going to be able to get to the shape that you're looking for. I like to add a little bit of shoulder to my bowls because that gives me a zone of material that I can use to my benefit in the end. It acts as a safety net in the event that I turn out the interior a little bit too deep, but it also allows me more material and flexibility to design the foot of the bowl at the very end of the turning because both that shoulder and the tenon can be used as part of the foot if I choose. Okay, so now we've got the bottom, the tenon, the shoulder, and the bottom section of the bowl completely flattened out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to continue working the corner and curving that shape up to the rim. So right there I'm getting kicked out because there's a thicker area of wood and thinner area. So there's air that goes by and then a thicker piece of the side bark comes by and whacks it right out of place. What, what you need to do in that situation, again, is put down pressure on the tool rest. You can see I'm repositioning my hand, so I'm putting a little more pressure down on the tool rest. And move the, the bulk out slowly into that location. So when that thicker piece comes by, this particular one is a problem because it's actually kind of ramped. So if you can imagine, it goes from air to a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker, and then thick. So it's... What it's doing is pushing out the tip of the bull gouge. So what I need to do is apply down pressure onto the tool rest and just let that thicker piece come by and get sliced off. Here you can see when you're looking straight down, that thicker piece is going by. The, the primary you know, rotation or dimension of this bull blank is right about where I'm cutting now. But then it breaks away and there's a big air gap and then there's a thick spot. So I want to apply a lot of down pressure and just go slow. And you want to go slow because you have to wait for each rotation for that thick spot to come around in order for it to be sliced. Okay, so now I'm going to take advantage of the other option with this lathe, which is to move the banjo and the tool rest to the side portion. And the handle for the banjo and tool rest can be changed, their locations can be changed to accommodate this. And it makes it pretty nice. Instead of taking the banjo and the tool rest and extending them from that original position way out around the corner where they're gonna, it's gonna be pretty vulnerable and not very secure, I can locate it here where I've got more stability. There are two bolts that 
tighten this that bed rail to the side of the lathe. Also, the robust tool rest and the locking mechanism for the tool rest is the best I've ever seen. It's actually a cam mechanism with two cylinders inside there that have angles on them. So they lock onto that tool rest shaft and do not let go. And it does not slide. I have absolutely never had that tool rest drop down into the banjo slot. Where I've had that happen on many other lathes that I've turned on. Okay, so we are cutting side grain here. This is not, the direction I'm cutting right now is not necessarily a supported green cut direction. But because we're perpendicular to the ingrain, it's not doing that much damage. The reason I'm doing this, this angle is I want to keep as much of that bark intact as possible. So I'm pushing in the direction of the bark with the wood underneath it so that that bark is stable and it's not being pressed off of the edge of the rim. If I were to do my cuts from the other direction, from the base of the bowl up to the rim, when I get up to that rim, not only am I going to knock off the bark, but I'm going to rip out the wood along that top edge, and I definitely don't want that. So by making the cuts from the rim down on a live edge bowl, that's going to keep that rim nice and intact. Now I'm going to relocate the tool rest, and I'm going to come around the side and, sh and take some of that thicker material away. There's some beautiful heartwood in this particular bulb blank. And now that I'm down to a level surface of wood all the way around, the blank is relatively balanced or as balanced as it's going to be with that uneven bark rim. And I can get the lathe speed up a little bit faster. Also, I'm getting a nice clean cut all the way around. I don't have that bouncing action that was going on on because of the irregular edge that happened before. Instead, I've got a really nice continuous cut with the bull gouge as I've worked along the surface. Here you can see what I'm doing. I'm basically doing a push cut from the base of the bull up to the rim. Look at those big shavings coming off of there. When, when wood is green or contains a lot of moisture, the shavings will be, they'll come off more intact like this. If you think of the side grain mounted bowl like a bundle of straws, we're cutting the side of those straws and then we're cutting the ends of the straws, then we cut the sides and then we cut the ends again. Well, when the wood's wet, that ingrain area, which is basically filled with holes, it bonds together better. And so those shavings, will, will they'll be longer. Typically, when we're turning dry wood, we only get the curly shavings from the side of those straws or the side grain because the ingrain is dried out, it's porous, and as we cut across the ends of those tubes, basically, they're they're just breaking apart and they turn into just dust. But when the wood's wet, it, it tends to, all the fibers tend to bond together longer and allows for these longer ribbons of shavings to come off. It's a good indication if, you've, if somebody's turning wet wood is the size of the shavings like you're seeing here, the length of them. There you can see the push cut from right to left. Again, the flute is rotated at about the 10, 1030 location. And I've switched over to my half inch bowl gouge. The half inch bowl gouge gives me a nicer finished surface, primarily because it's cutting just a, a little bit smaller area than the 5 8 inch bowl gouge. And that forces me to slow down a little bit the more time that you let the lathe rotate and make the cut by slowing down the pace of the bull gouge, the cleaner that surface is going to be. OK, 
Okay, so now I've got the bulk of the blank removed. I can start thinking about the, the shape that I want to do. But before I can do that, I need to sharpen. Now, the biggest thing that I can tell you guys about sharpening, and I teach this in my tool sharpening e-course online, which there's a link in the description if you'd like to check that out. One of the biggest things to, to do as a turner is to be alert and pay attention to the performance of the tool. Once you have the tool sharpened, like we're going to do right now, I'm going to go back to the lathe and it's going to cut beautifully. And what happens typically is I'll start turning and I'll start thinking about the shape of the bowl. I'll start thinking about what I want to do next. And I'll start thinking about a bunch of other things and I'll stop thinking about the performance of that bowl or the bowl gouge. And as I turn, the more I turn, the longer or the duller that blade is going to get. And I'll, and if I'm not paying attention to it, it's going to get dull to the point where it's causing issues. The biggest thing you could do is actually pay attention and remember how smoothly that cut when you first sharpened it. As soon as you sense something has changed and it's not cutting as well, then go back and sharpen. That's how you know when to sharpen. Now I've set this shot up so that you can see the side of this bowl really well. And you can see what I'm doing. I'm bringing up the bottom curve of this piece and I'm shaping that. Now, as I'm turning, I'm not looking so much at the tool on the tool rest. I'm looking across the top edge of the bowl and looking at the shape of the bowl just as you're seeing right here. At this point, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an OG shape. So the bottom portion of the bowl is going to jut out a little bit or be convex and right up near the rim it's going to be concave. It's going to be just a very subtle OG. I'm using push cuts at the moment to hog out this material. And while I'm shaping like this I'm not real concerned about the quality of that surface. I'm more concerned with getting the shape right and then I'll go back and make that surface nice and smooth. Okay, I'm using a scraping cut here. And the scraping cut is great for just pulling out a lot of material quickly. And you can see it shaping that bottom curve. This bowl is big enough that I need to stop every once in a while and kind of step back just a bit and check out the shape again. Here's the scraping cut. A scraping cut works good for little cavities like this where it's hard to start a push cut. And then I'll switch over to a push cut here. And if you look over to the right side of the screen, you can actually see where I'm picking up that curve from the scraping cut. I was making a, a cut, a pass a little too deep there. So I backed off and did a little bit thinner, thinner pass. And then I can come back to where I was initially. I'm going to come into the shoulder just a bit. I don't need that much material for the shoulder. The shoulder is very important because it's going to, it's going to be the location where the top of the chuck jaws will rest. So we have to have that shoulder there, but it doesn't have to be as big as it is right now. You can see those flat shavings coming off of the scraping cut that are sitting on the tool rest there. So this is the convex portion of the exterior. And right about here is going to be the concave area near the rim. You can see me rotating the bull gouge there from over to the left. All right, now you're starting to see that OG shape. I want to work that area up along the rim and get that 
that edge the curve right up to the highest point on the live edge. I have to stop and check this frequently and you, I'm not up there yet. I still have another inch or so to go. So I've got to take that curve up higher. Boy, the green of this bull is absolutely beautiful. If you like this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen. It helps this video and helps the whole channel. And I greatly appreciate you clicking that and I appreciate you. Thank you. So I'm going to make really slow passes here. Again, I'm going to be cutting air. This is almost like the beginning of the piece where I'm going to get some vibration here. So I'm putting a lot of extra pressure down onto the tool rest. I'm not pushing into the bull blank. And it's time to sharpen again. You can see how worn out that edge has gotten. And when I'm sharpening, I'm sharpening both sides evenly so that the tool stays balanced. <laughs> Look at the shavings we've got already. This is just the exterior. Looks like an ant mound. <laughs> okay, so here you can see the shape again. I've got a high spot in the convex area. And I can see that I really want that foot to come down a little bit. It, you know, when you're shaping a bowl like this by eye, Stepping away for just a minute is actually very helpful and just stepping away going over to the sharpening station and sharpening this Helped me see that I really want to take that curve down a bit And I know that I need to make a I need to take some of this down so they have more material Or I can create that curve better into the rim And that's what I'm doing right here I'm up into that sap wood. That's a lighter color wood in this bowl blank, and it's really coming out in big, thick ribbons. Almost there, but not quite. I still got a little section to get up to that top spot. Now, looking at this, I could have taken a little more time and balanced this rim out a little more so that that high spot was not as high up as the opposite side. Ideally, I should have two sides. On the other side, I should have an area that's a, about the same height, doing the same thing that this one is. I'm just going to take your time and get around that, that curve. Okay. And now I've got to connect these other lines. I'm still in a roughing stage here. I'm not trying to make finishing passes here. You can see plenty of grooves in the piece. The OG makes a really nice shape for a bowl because it, it makes that top rim open and exposed. It makes it very inviting. It creates like almost a frame for whatever you have in it. So you can fill this with fruit and whatever you'd like, and it's going to have a, a sense. You're still going to be able to see the rim really well because it, it will flare out just a bit. There's the OG shape we're looking for. Got a slight convex in the middle and then a concave up near the rim. There we go. Now it's rough. You can see where I, I passed too quickly. The pace of the bull gouge went too quickly and created grooves there. That's how those tool marks were formed. So now with my half inch bull gouge, I'm going to go in here and just lightly take off that top layer and leave a nice smooth finish. You can see how wet that wood is. And 
this is the view and this is what I look at while I'm turning. I'm watching that top edge and you can see it progress right there. This is really important for understanding how to make a really nice curve. Is you're going to watch that top edge. I just flared it right into that existing curve because I know the top curve was working. So I'm going to use the shear scrape method to clean off any rough areas and this will do a little bit of final shaping as well but this is primarily for smoothing that surface real nice. I'm going to clean up the shape of the tenon cylinder. Then I'm going to get my 3 8 inch spindle detail gouge. I'll use the spindle detail gouge to form the dovetail angle for the tenon. Basically just let the edge start. I've got the flute closed at about 90 degrees facing the bulb blank and just push in. My dovetail jaws on my chucks are at about 11 degree angle. And after you've done a few of these you can kind of eyeball it and that's what I do here. And I also want to clean off the top of that shoulder. As I'm getting ready to move the bull blank around and flip it around to do the interior, I think this video is getting pretty long. I don't want to bore you guys to death and I want to make this uh, a little bit digestible. So I'm going to break this bowl into two videos. The next video will do the entire interior and finish up the bowl so you can see that whole process. I hope you've liked this video. If you have, do me a huge favor and click that like button. That helps this video and helps the channel. I greatly appreciate that. If you are not subscribing, please subscribe. I've got a ton of great videos and I have many more on the way. Click that bell and you'll be notified when my next videos come out. So until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy turning.